One of the compromises that Admiral Chowdhury had to make to get this adopted was to take out the section that provided a budget for culture of peace at the UN. That's the way the northern countries have to control things. And so the UN has no budget for culture of peace. There's no staff member responsible for culture of peace. There's no publicity for culture of peace by the UN whatsoever, because no one's responsible. And the, the rich countries have made sure that that's the case. Uh, five years ago, as, as Joanne knows very well, we did a midterm report on the decade. We're now in the end of the decade for a culture of peace. We did a midterm report from civil society. 700 civil society organizations around the world told about what they're doing for a culture of peace. And their conclusion was, yes, we are making progress, but nobody knows about it because A, the UN doesn't want to talk about it, and B, the mass media says that's not newsworthy. The report was requested in a UN resolution. We sent the report to the Secretary General with a copy of the request saying, here is the report that was requested and it was thrown in the wastebasket by his staff who were Americans and Brits. You know, don't forget, the, the Secretary General's phone is tapped. His staff is American and British. He's not free to do what he wants to do. So it was thrown in the wastebasket, never published by the UN. That's what we're up against. Fortunately, in the Declaration and Program of Action, we kept in a phrase that there should be a global movement for a culture of peace, composed not only of the UN and the member states, which are not going to do anything, but also the civil society. And in the year 2000, we distributed uh, something called the Manifesto 2000, which was a commitment to make a culture of peace in your daily life. We had an enormous apparatus to work on this at the UN. We had all the national commissions, civil society organizations, UNDP, etc. And 1% of the population of the planet Earth signed. 75 million people signed the Manifesto 2000. And then it was killed. You never heard of it again. But we showed that people want it, that they understand it and they want it. So the first step was taken. I recently completed a book called The History of the Culture of War. And after looking at the history of the culture of war, beginning back with prehistory, coming to the present time, there's one inescapable conclusion, which is that the nation state was not only born out of the culture of war, but over the course of 5,000 years, the nation state has made it its business to monopolize war, of war. To the point that when Max Weber, the great sociologist, defined the nation state, his definition was the following. The state is the organization with a monopoly of violence on its territory, period. The state is the organization with a monopoly of violence on its territory, which means that if you try to raise a private army or if you're a tribe and you try to make war, the state will crush you because only the state can make war. You can go to Europe, you can see the old city walls in Europe from the days when cities had wars. Not anymore. No city has the right to put up a wall and raise its own army. Only the state. The state has become the culture of war. In fact, the definition of a failed state Anybody here from Somalia or Afghanistan, which are failed states? What is the definition of a failed state? The failed state is a state that has lost its monopoly of violence. That is the definition of a failed state. Well, where are you from? So you know, Afghanistan does not monopolize, the state of Afghanistan does not monopolize violence. 
you have warlord here, warlord there, NATO here, Americans there, everybody's shooting everybody. <laughs> and the state is a couple of people in, in Kabul somewhere. Right? Sad. Well, the state system is not sustainable. Let's come back to the bad news. It's not sustainable. It will crash. Now, I happen to be privileged because I've seen this. I speak Russian and I worked over the years as a scientist building labs in the old Soviet Union. And I watched an empire crash from inside. And I saw clearly how empires crash. There are two factors, economic and political. The economic factor is that a, war, a warfare state plows its resources into its military. And military production is non-productive. As one famous sociologist put it, it's the equivalent of throwing your resources into the sea. What does the United States export now with all of its tremendous industrial Arms? product? Do we produce any television sets in America? Any computers in America? Can you buy things in the, in the, in the uh, store from America, made in America? No, we import from China, from Mexico, from whatever. Huh? So the first problem is a severe balance of payments problem. That you, you import, you import, you import, but you don't export. And eventually, economically, that crashes. The second problem is political. I went down in my town the other day and I passed a couple of federal buildings. You can't enter federal buildings in America anymore. There are guard stations and roadblocks and metal detectors and guards that say, what are you doing here? What do you want? That was what it was like in Moscow in the 80s. You couldn't go into any building. Everything was, where's your pass? What business do you have here? There's a severe alienation of the people from their government to the point that people say, that's not our government. I don't know who they are as running this country, but it's not us. There's no participation. So when, in 1989, the ruble crashed and Gorbachev was deposed, nobody came out in the streets to save the system. They said, let it go. It's not out. And when the present empire finally crashes, we will have such alienation that people will say, let it go. These are the two things, the economic and the political, of how empires crash. <laughs>